just go on full screen. Right, okay, so hopefully we are now live. Um, so hello everyone, um, thanks for joining us for another edition of Quarantine Thermo. Um, this week uh, we're very happy to welcome Dr. Matteo Lostaglio, um, who I completely messed up his affiliation. He is not no longer at ICFO, he's actually uh, at Delft now, so sorry about that Matteo. <laughs> <No Um, worries. laughs> um, so just before we start, um, I'm guessing most of the people here um, have sort of already tuned into some of the previous ones, but for anyone who is kind of new to the format, um, I'm going to, in a minute, uh, Matteo is going to share his screen um, and then he'll speak interrupted for about 45 minutes or so. Um, and then at the end, I will moderate questions from the audience, which you can just write directly in the YouTube chat. So if you have any questions at all during the talk, um, just write them in the chat as you think of them and I'll pick them up at the end. Um, and as always, you know, please do share and, and, and tell everyone um, about this initiative um, if, uh, if you haven't done so already. So um, yeah, it's a real pleasure to welcome Matteo. Um, I guess most of you already know him. Uh, he is um, an expert in, well, I mean, he made very pioneering contributions to the theory of uh, coherence uh, and, and the resource theory of quantum thermodynamics. Um, but more importantly, he is a fellow alumnus of Imperial College, um, right. and he is going to tell us today uh, about certifying quantumness in, in thermal machines. So please go ahead, Matteo. Thank you very much, Mark, and uh, thank you to all, all of the organizers for giving me the opportunity, and of course, thank you for tuning in. So um, I hope you're doing reasonably well uh, in these uh, circumstances. So I'll share the screen here. Do you see, um, I hope you're seeing now the, the layout of the talk? Uh, actually, Mark? I just see a black screen at the moment. It's not the, it's, oh uh, yeah, okay, now, there we go, there we go, yeah. Okay, sorry. So, yeah, that's perfect, right. that's perfect. Oh, okay, okay, thank you. So, uh, yeah, as Mark said, uh, I'm gonna tell you about our recent work on certifying quantum signatures in uh, quantum heat engine. So this is the archive number if you're interested in more detail. But just to uh, briefly put this, um, yeah, this question in, in, uh, in perspective, uh, of course, the quantum thermodynamics community is very broad. So we have very different objectives and different aims and different frameworks that we're using. But I think probably most of us would agree that um, a common objective is to uh, identify uh, quantum advantages in some quantum thermodynamic framework uh, protocol and hopefully uh, harness them in, in some technological relevant application. So um, along the way, uh, along this path, which is, uh, I believe, still a bit far uh, away from what we've got now, uh, I would argue that an important milestone is to uh, find reliable ways in which you can certify quantum signatures. And what I'm going uh, to um, tell you about here is uh, why I think uh, we need this kind of certification methods. Um, secondly, um, how can you obtain, uh, well, at least one way that I found to uh, obtain such certificates. And um, finally, I'm gonna um, give you an outlook of um, yeah, where we, I think we are and how uh, we should proceed uh, further uh, with this kind of uh, line of, of attack, let's say. Um, so let me, let me start, if the question is to certify uh, a quantum advantage or a quantum signature, let me start with um, a funny example of what is definitely not a quantum signature. And I'm gonna use this example of the quantum toaster, which is uh, a device uh, invented by uh, David Jennings a few years ago. And uh, I'm, I got inspired uh, uh, from that device, let's say. Uh, and what is a quantum toaster? Well, that's just a standard toaster to which we attach a single photon interferometer. So what we've got here is a single photon that is coming in here and because of quantum interference, it's the photon is going through uh, in a superposition of both paths, and it's going to come out 100% of the time from port one, 
And uh, as it goes out, port one is going to activate the toaster and you're gonna get a toast toasted, no? So this machine is gonna have a yield, if we want to talk about the yield of this machine, of one toast per photon, okay? Now, uh, what happens if I do a measurement uh, in the interferometer of uh, that is going to reveal the which path information? So it's going to tell me if the photon is in the upper branch or in the lower branch. And in this way, it's destroying the quantum interference effects. Then, of course, the photon is going to be found 50% of the times in the lower branch and 50% of the time in the upper branch. And so it's going to come out 50% of the times in the uh, out of port one, and it's going to activate uh, the toaster, and so you're gonna get a toast, but 50% of the times it's gonna go out of port two, and you're gonna get nothing, okay? And uh, so the yield, once you destroy the quantum interference inside the machine, becomes just half toast per photon. So the yield is half once you destroy the quantum uh, interference, the quantum effects inside the machine. And of course, uh, this is just a, a silly example, but it's, what, I, what it displays is that uh, simply the fact that if you remove quantum uh, effects from your machine, you're gonna get a lower uh, yield, a lower performance. It doesn't mean that we, are, uh, that we found a quantum advantage. And what's the reason? Well, in this case, it's pretty obvious that the reason is simply that there is a very simple way of emulating this machine, which is I can just throw away completely the interferometer and I can just keep the toaster, no? And I can just toast my toast in a completely classical way. So the problem that I want to get uh, into is to how do we rigorously formulate the notion of uh, classically emulating a machine? So classical emulation. So, and in particular, so um, first one wants to formalize this notion. And secondly, uh, once you have some sort of formalization of this notion, you want to certify that there is not such uh, classical emulation of your machine. So this is a necessary condition for your machine to actually uh, be doing something interesting, no? that you cannot just simply emulate it with a classical machine. So let me uh, then um, move into the first question here, which is um, how do we uh, uh, formalize the notion of a classical emulation? Um, and rather than just jumping straight in in the definition that I will be using, let me uh, just uh, take some random examples, well, random examples, some examples I know about in the literature, I'm sure that there are uh, many others. Uh, of classical emulations that have been considered. So um, the first one in this paper from 2017 is simply just Hamiltonian dynamics. So this is just using a completely classical model. Uh, you have just particles or some distribution in phase space. And this was a model that was used to uh, say reassess or analyze uh, certain claims that were made about um, the relation between quantum coherence and cooling. In particular, in particular, it was found out that in certain systems, if you um, if you take a quantum system that is initially in a superposition of different energies, then you can get better cooling than if you do not have that superposition. And what uh, the authors here were attempting was to try to reproduce the qualitative behavior of that phenomenon in a completely classical model. Um, the second model here, um, this is the, uh, this model from, uh, or sets of models from this nice recent paper uh, from 2019, Gonzalez and, and others. Um, what they were using was, they were not using phase space, their um, set of states that they were using for the emulation was just a set of energy levels, so a discrete set of allowed um, energies. And then you had jump probabilities between those energies that were determined by some rate equations that they 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 uh, they postulated. So this is of course a stochastic machine, so a machine where there is no uh, quantum effect at all. Everything that there is is jumping with certain probabilities between different energies. And what they were uh, doing here is to emulate several quantum coherent engines um, using this classical uh, emulator. And um, another model that is worth mentioning because it's um, quite often used 
for example, in this paper by Ram and others, is uh, a model where you just take quantum mechanics here and you just um, deface in the energy basis. And similarly to the previous model, what you get after defacing the energy basis is essentially a classical model where you just have jump probabilities between different energy levels. So these are all possible emulators that you can consider when you've got some quantum effects and you want to uh, try to understand if that quantum effect or the phenomenology related to that quantum effect can be actually reproduced by a classical machine. And um, the point here is that all of these models uh, can be seen as examples of what is technically known as a non-contextual ontological model, which is the set of models that we'll be talking about. And the main question here that I would like to address is, how do we certify that a quantum thermodynamic protocol cannot be emulated by any of these classical models? Because just showing, you know, there are infinitely many of them and the bound is just our fantasy in some, in some sense. And uh, if we identify some something that we think can be a quantum advantage, we can, in some sense, we can never be sure that there isn't some funny way of reproducing it with some, say, some Hamiltonian dynamics with some funny interactions. So uh, how do we somehow close the door completely and we say, okay, there is just no way, whatever is the model that you're taking, um, there's just no classical emulation that you can find. So this is the question I would like to address here. Um, so as I said, I'm going to use this notion of an ontological model. So this is a um, quantum foundation jar uh, jargon, but um, I think basically the idea is that uh, when you want to describe a quantum experiment, it's good to uh, kind of separate out three different categories that here correspond to these three different columns in the in the in uh, in the table so you can think about the experiment operationally uh, where each component of the experiment is a sort of black box so you you're gonna have a kind of preparation black box which is just a set of uh, preparation instructions that you're following in your laboratory to set up your experiment there will be transformation procedures that are the set of instructions. Again, you're following your laboratory to transform your uh, system from one state to another. And finally, there will be a measurement procedure that is what is allowing you to extract outcomes from the experiment. At the end of the day, the, uh, if you want the bare data that you're collecting is a probability distribution. It's a probability of getting outcomes K given that you follow the preparation procedure P, transformation procedure T, and measurement procedure M. So this is just the data that you're collecting. Then everything you do later is interpretation of that data or giving a physical description of what's going on. And typically what we do is just a quantum description of this experiment, if it's a quantum experiment. So we're gonna associate a density operator to uh, the preparation procedure, so density operator, uh, to the transformation procedure, we can associate a quantum channel, epsilon here. Um, and finally, to the measurement procedure, we can associate a set of positive operators, which is a P of M, so each for every outcome. And then if this is a quantum experiment, these probabilities that I'm observing, I'm expecting that I will be able to explain them through the Born rule, which is just a trace of epsilon rho with EK. Okay. Now, uh, given uh, such uh, situation, then one can start to think about possible classical emulations. So how is, how is a classical emulation going to look like in general? Well, in general, you're going to have a set of states that are the states of your emulation that I'm going to call lambda. So these states, for example, may be phase space points, in, like in the first example of the previous slide, or they may be some set of energy levels, like in the second example that I mentioned. And the preparation procedure in terms of your classical emulation will correspond to the preparation of one of these states, or even more generally, to the preparation on, of some state with some probability. So some probability distribution over your set of states. So for example, uh, the preparation if the preparation procedure may correspond to, uh, say, preparing your uh, a probability distribution over phase space, which is a thermal distribution with respect to your system Hamiltonian. So just to give you an example. Um, then there is a transformation procedure. So what, how is the transformation procedure going to look like in a classical emulation? Well, this is just going to be a rule 
that tells you how you update your state. So in general, it's just going to tell you if you are given some state lambda, what's the probability that you later jump to uh, state lambda prime. Now, this uh, rule here may be a deterministic rule, like it happens in classical uh, Hamiltonian dynamics, uh, so that lambda prime might, may be just the Hamiltonian evolved of lambda, and lambda, of course, fa a phase space point, or it may be stochastic, like in the second example, the one with the Markov uh, jumps. Uh, this probability may be the probability that is generated by some rate equation. And there are, of course, many, many other uh, emulations that you can think of. And in the end, you're going to give me a rule to update my state. Um, finally, there will be uh, what is associated to a measurement procedure. Well, it's a, what you associate is what's called a response function, or simply just the probability that you output outcome k if your state in your uh, emulation is lambda prime. Okay, just a rule to give me some state, some outcomes with certain probabilities. And then what's the, how is the classical emulator going to explain uh, this raw data here? Well, it's just going to explain it through, um, well, let's leave the sum a second uh, out. It's just propagation of probability. So you can imagine that you're starting with some probability P of lambda, you're in state lambda. Then with some probability, you're jumping from lambda to lambda prime. And then given that you're in lambda prime, with some probability, you're outputting outcome K. OK, so then, of course, I need to sum over all of the variables. But this is the probability that is going to be uh, defined by your classical emulator and just given by the propagation of the probabilities that we introduced here. OK, so this is the general structure of uh, what's called in foundational ontological model. But we can just think about it as a classical emulation or a classical simulation of your experiment. Um, now, um, there is one problem still, which is actually this description is too general. I mean, everything can be described by some, uh, some ontological model of this kind. So every quantum statistics can be described in this way. Even every post-quantum statistics can be described in this way. So you need some restriction to these models to be able to define them as some you know, you need to define some notion of classicality. What does it mean that this emulation is classical? Because up to now, it's completely general. Um, so, and uh, to, do, uh, to do so, uh, I will uh, introduce a strong notion of non-classicality that is called contextuality. So this was introduced by um, uh, Rob Speckens in 2005, and it's generalizing an older notion that goes back to the 60s by Kosher and Specker. So this is a well-known notion of non-classicality. And uh, to introduce it, I will need one more definition, which is uh, the definition of when two procedures are operationally equivalent. So two procedures are operationally equivalent when whatever experiment you do, they give you the same statistics. So for example, um, if you take two transformations, T and T prime, you're going to say that these are equivalent so T is equivalent to T prime that I'm going to uh, uh, denote with this, uh, with this symbol here. Um, if any experiment you do, you cannot distinguish from the statistics that you collect if you did T or T prime. So what it means, well, this is your statistics. So your probability in any experiment. So this is the probability if you did some preparation P and some measurement M and you use the transformation t so say that whatever experiment you do you cannot distinguish sorry uh, you cannot distinguish if you applied t or t prime so the pro the outcome statistics that you get for every preparation measurement that you sandwich your transformation with is exactly the same for t and t prime well this is the definition of what i mean by operational equivalent. So they are completely indistinguishable in any experiment, if you want to say it in a, uh, briefly. Okay, so this is what operational equivalence is. Um, then what is then a non-contextual emulator? So a non-contextual emulator is one that gives identical descriptions to operationally equivalent procedures. So this may sound a bit complicated, but it's actually just telling you that if you have two things that cannot be distinguished whatever experiment you do, 
you should not describe them differently in your emulator. So once again, if you go, if I go back to these two preparations, to these two transformations, so assume that they are completely indistinguishable in any experiment. So whatever measurement statistics you collect for whatever preparation and measurement you do, then you want in a non-contextual model that the, the, the uh, update rule that you associate to T, so the probability of jumping from lambda to lambda prime, should be the same as the probability in your emulator for, um, for T prime. So if T and T prime cannot be distinguished operationally, they shouldn't be described differently in your emulator. Um, now, every model that I mentioned before uh, can be seen as a non-contextual uh, emulator. So classical mechanics, so, um, it's maybe not immediately obvious, but it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's by default a non-contextual model. And all of the models I was mentioning are non-contextual. So all classical models essentially are uh, of this kind. Um, so now uh, the way that you can uh, now formalize the question we started with is the following. So can we certify that a given protocol cannot be emulated whatever is your, um, uh, your non-contextual uh, model that you're using to emulate it? So we want to, um, I want to, uh, maybe I'm repeating myself, but we want to exclude all of them at once, okay? So all of the classical mechanics models and uh, all of the jump probability models that I was mentioning and any number of uh, other models. Uh, why do we want to exclude them? Because we don't want to find ourselves in a sort of quantum toaster situation where you identify something that looks quantum, but then actually there is some simple way that we simply didn't realize maybe yet to uh, reproduce the same statistics by a model that is uh, classical. So that's the idea. Um, so this is somehow concludes the first part of uh, why we need a certificate and what is a certificate. Um, and then I move to the recipe, if you want, for how do you obtain a certificate. So um, this recipe works in linear response. So there may be others that work in other regimes. The one that I found here is for linear response. So what's the setting? You've got a quantum system uh, governed by some time-dependent Hamiltonian H of T. So with some H of zero, some system Hamiltonian, plus G, some coupling, times B of T, some perturbation. And the first thing you need to do in this recipe is to check that you have got some linear response so that the linear terms are not vanishing, essentially. So suppose that you got your, your uh, protocol or your uh, quantum system undergoes some perturbation and you see some linear response. All right. Second, you need to verify a technical condition. So now it's not very important uh, the exact form of this condition, but what's important is um, that what you need to do is essentially build a matrix, this matrix J here, which is built using the eigenvalues of this operator. So this operator is just the uh, integral from time zero to your fixed uh, dynamical time T um, of, the, uh, of the perturbation in interaction picture. So this is a linear response operator that you need to compute anyway when you compute the linear, the quantum linear response. So once you compute this operator, what you need to do is to look at the eigenvalues. The eigenvalues go into this matrix here, and you need to check a positivity condition, okay, for this matrix. Now, okay, so you build your matrix, you plug in these eigenvalues that are um, eigenvalues of this linear response operator, and say that I find that J is uh, positive definite. Okay, then this result follows, and this is somehow uh, the main result of, the, of this work, that every um, non-contextual emulator uh, will have a order G square response. So if two is satisfied, any non-contextual emulator will have a order G square response. So what does it mean? Well, it means that when you go to the weak coupling limit, so G is small enough, then the uh, response of 
any non-contextual emulator will be much smaller than the quantum response because the quantum response is by assumption of order G, whereas uh, the response of the non-contextual emulator is at most of order G square. So in this sense, you can then identify uh, op you can then identify um, a quantum. Uh, you can certify that your uh, uh, your linear response cannot be reproduced by any non-contextual emulator. Okay, so including all of the models that we usually use, like the ones I was mentioning before, and in particular, just Hamiltonian dynamics. So uh, let me uh, very briefly go through a proof check uh, sketch, just to, not to go through the detail, but just to tell you somehow what's going on behind the scenes and how this connects with the notion of non-contextuality I mentioned before. So what's going on behind the scenes is that this technical condition here, what implies, it implies the following fact, it implies that if you take your unitary, so this is your unitary in interaction picture, which is the unitary generated by your, uh, your perturbation. So if you mix this unitary here with just its inverse, so the unitary you dagger, then what you find out is that, is that for G small enough, you can, and assuming condition two is satisfied, you can in fact decompose the sum as one minus PD times the identity channel plus PD, some other channel C, okay? So C is some channel here, uh, and I is the identity. And importantly, PD is something that scales with G square, okay? Now, uh, if you look at this operator equality, what you can realize is that actually this is an operational equivalence. So operational equivalence. So in what sense it's an operational equivalence? Well, okay, this is an operator equality, but well, what does it mean in practice? Well, in practice, it means that if you do an experiment and you take the mixture of this unitary U, the unitary that your system is undergoing and its dagger, there is no way that you can distinguish this operation from another operation, which, which looks a priori quite different, which is with probability one minus P, you do nothing. And with probability P, you do some other channel C, which is now not important exactly what it is. So this is in fact then an operational equivalence, and then you can apply your non-contextuality assumption. So remember that in any classical emulation, what you're doing is you are associating to each of these operations some um, some uh, object in the classical emulation. So the unitary will be associated to some jump probability from one state to another. Um, in the same way, the dagger unitary will be associated to some other um, update rule and so on. No? The identity operation will be associated to a delta function here in your, uh, your variable, whatever these are, phase space or anything else. And C will be also associated to some update rule. But then the non-contextuality assumption applied to this operational equivalence tells, tells you, okay, these two ways are, um, these two transformations actually cannot be distinguished by any measurement statistics that you can collect. So on the left-hand side, you have an operation that in the emulation looks like this. So you're gonna have one half this probability of jumping plus the probability P prime of jumping. And on the right hand side here, you've got one minus PD, a delta function on your uh, simulation variables, plus PD, well, some other probability, P second. So in general, these, these two things may be different, but in a non-contextual model, you're requiring that these two are the same. Why? Well, because the assumption of non-contextuality is that if two things are operational and distinguishable, they should be described in the same way in your classical emulator. So uh, that's the idea. And uh, using this condition here, uh, there are of course some steps. What you can prove is that the response of, your, of any of this non-contextual emulator for any observable O is actually bounded by something that scales as order G square. So you got this PD here, 
which is of course order G square, as I mentioned before. So the response of your of any non-contextual emulator is order G square, which is too weak to explain the quantum uh, response, which is by assumption of order G. So notice this small caveat here, that um, here you've got the maximum eigenvalue of your observable. So this is, of course, not a problem in any finite dimensional system. It may be a bit of a problem if you're interested more in continuous variable systems, even though in principle, maybe one can uh, solve this issue by an appropriate cutoff, but I haven't thought about, about this. But um, in any case, uh, Let's see how to apply just this, uh, now going back to the recipe, let's apply this recipe to a quantum thermodynamics uh, problem, which is what uh, we wanted. So what I'm gonna look here is a two stroke engine, and I'm gonna show you that the power output cannot be explained classically. So a two stroke engine, so this is a stro uh, an engine with two uh, steps as the name says. So in the first step, you've got here a cold and a hot bath, so you got a quantum system coming in, and the quantum system in the first stroke is interacting simultaneously with the hot and the cold bath. Okay, so this is the first stroke. And what comes out is some non-equilibrium state, which is your uh, quantum resource, okay? Um, so the state is coming out, let me call it raw when it comes out. And what you do in the second stroke, you just do a unitary interaction with the system that is getting some work out. So W is the work that you're getting out. This is the second stroke. And then, yeah, and then either a fresh system is coming in or you're sort of putting the system back in, in the, in the engine. Okay, so you're repeating the first stroke and so on. Um, so let me, uh, let me then uh, analyze this engine for simplicity for a single qubit. And it was noticed uh, before, I don't know actually where this thing was noticed for the first time. Definitely it's noticed in the paper I was mentioning before, the PRX paper with uh, Ram uh, and others, that if the system that is coming out from the first stage is not commuting with the system Hamiltonian, um, then the work output that you get in the weak coupling regime is scaling as order G, okay? which is good because actually, if you remember the recipe, this was the first of the two conditions of the recipe. And um, what's more, in that paper, it was also noticed that if you take your, um, your single qubit here that is coming out from the first stage, if you, um, if you deface it in the energy basis, of course, defacing in energy basis, what it's doing is to uh, make this commutation become an equality, so the rho is going to commute with H0. If you deface it, the work output, and then, of course, also the power, it's going to scale with order G square, which is much worse in the, in the, um, in the weak coupling regime, okay? Um, but however, uh, of course, as I, as I tried to argue before, just to notice that if you remove some quantum effect from your engine, engine then your uh, performance is uh, lower, is uh, necessary, but it's an insufficient criterion to be able to say that this engine cannot be uh, classically emulated. However, what happens, and here we're gonna use this uh, recipe I mentioned, is that for qubit systems um, and any non-trivial perturbations, the second uh, requirement in this recipe, this technical condition, is automatically satisfied, okay? So then you've got the first condition satisfied because if your uh, system is coming out with some coherence and you've got the second condition satisfied by default. So then you can use the, the, this two-step recipe to claim that the um, power output of the two-stroke engine Um, cannot be reproduced by any classical emulator, meaning non-contextual emulator. Okay, so, um, so in this sense, you can now say, well, okay, it's not just that if I deface my engine, I get something that is worse. The fact is actually 
um, I cannot explain this phenomenology, so this advantage in the power output in the weak coupling regime um, um, by any non-contextual emulator, whatever that emulator is, okay? So that's the idea. Okay, so let me uh, start moving towards a conclusion. Um, I think uh, the basic message is that um, um, I've given a way to reliably certify a quantum signature in the sense of certifying that there cannot be classical emulators of your machine, okay? In the very broad sense of non-contextual uh, models, which is a very broad notion that includes essentially every emulation that I know of in the literature. Um, so, however, if, if uh, again, we go back to this picture of moving towards this uh, far away objective of identifying quantum advantages uh, or relevant quantum advantages, um, how could one move forward? I think um, even from the point of view of certification, it would be nice to have, in a sense, stronger certifications. So in particular, certificates that are using only um, 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 that are more native to the problem, that are only using uh, facts that are native to the problem. So what I mean by that, so if you remember, there was this condition too, this technical condition that implied this funny operational equivalence. So this was an equivalence that te told you that if you mix your, uh, the unitary of your engine, so this is the engine unitary, with its inverse, then, well, you can decompose this for G small enough uh, as something that is, well, with probability one minus P, you do nothing, with probability P, you do some something else, okay? So this was an operational equivalence, and by the assumption of non-contextuality, the model was restricted to satisfy the same relation at the level of your emulation. So the emulator, so the classical emulator uh, uh, was forced to reproduce this feature of the quantum engine. So this is a feature of the quantum engine that we are requiring any classical emulator to reproduce because it, it's observed in the quantum engine and I'm, we are asking to reproduce it also in the emulator. However, from a completely, if you, if, you, if you allow me the term technological perspective, maybe I don't care about reproducing this operational equivalence. At the end, I only want the, um, a machine that is reproducing the power output. No? Um, so maybe I don't care. I, okay, I don't reproduce important certain important features of the quantum problem, but I can get the power output that I want. So how do we go around this problem? Well, you may think uh, initially, well, what about we just throw away uh, completely uh, this requirement? We don't require the, the classical emulator to satisfy this operation equivalence. However, okay, this is, um, this is something that cannot work because then you don't have any constraint. Okay. In particular, it is, of course, possible to have classical linear response, which is of order G. Nothing is um, preventing us from having um, classical linear response of order G. No? What is preventing to have classical linear response of order G was this operational equivalence, was the fact that the quantum engine was also satisfying um, this condition. So here, what I mean by, uh, by then, uh, what, uh, moving forward, I, um, one can imagine to be able to replace this condition with some new condition that is more native and more relevant to the problem. Maybe something related to energy conservation, for example. Uh, something that cannot be just brushed aside easily uh, by, by, uh, the classical, by the classical emulator. So this is a slightly subtle point, so um, I maybe move forward, but please, if you have a question, uh, please let me know um, later or uh, via email. Um, so let me go to the conclusions. Um, so as a maybe, again, as a catchphrase, uh, one could say if a quantum engine looks fancy, it doesn't mean it is fancy. So you need a certificate. So this goes back to the, if you want to the quantum toaster, because not all quantum toasters look immediately like quantum toasters. No? And uh, there is always maybe the small possibility that, you know, uh, there is a very hidden toaster in a fancy looking engine. 
So what you need is really a certificate that tells you, okay, this is genuinely different from anything that we could do with a classical machine. Um, secondly, uh, I argue that the order G power scaling of a two-stroke quantum engine can be certified against arbitrary emulation, non-contextual emulations. Uh, so I, I believe, as far as I know, that this is the first uh, kind of emulation, uh, first kind of certificate where you can exclude um, essentially any classical, that any classical model can reproduce the same thing. Um, this is actually, uh, so the same tool, so the same uh, two-step recipe can actually be used in much more general scenarios, essentially anything in linear response. One could try to certify quantum phenomena uh, using this recipe. So if you're interested, I'm also interested in looking into, into uh, other phenomena that could be certified using the same strategy. And finally, as I mentioned, I think we still need better certificate. Um, where we require only the emulation of features that are, in, a, in some sense, native to the problem. So I haven't defined this properly, I just tried to give an idea, but something that cannot be easily uh, sidestepped, in some sense, by your uh, classical machine. Um, so with this, I'm, uh, I finish. So this is, again, the archive number, if you're interested in details. So um, thank you very much for listening, and I'll be happy to try to answer any question that you may have. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Matteo. That was great. Um, Thank you. So, yeah, so we'll have, um, well, we've already actually had quite a few very interesting questions. Um, I, if, if the, the questioners don't mind me being so rude as to ask a much simpler and kind of stupid question that I think might help me to understand the, the answer to, to the follow up questions. Um, and maybe it would be useful to, for some other people like me who don't really know anything about foundations. So, I mean, I always thought naively that contextuality was somehow connected to um, kind of non-commutativity or kind of complementarity of different observables. Is that mm -hmm. somehow right? But so, c can you give like a simple example of how your kind of definition of contextuality encapsulates that? Because I, I was just a bit confused by by the definition. I mean, it's just my own stupidity, but I don't know if that's a question no, that's possible no, to no, answer. No, this is, no, no, this is completely not obvious. So, uh, well, this is definition that was uh, put forward by Speckens in 2005 can be seen as a generalization of that notion, so of the notion of context. So I think uh, one of the um, way that people usually do is, okay, you give me an observable, okay, and uh, so, or a set of projectors, no? And then imagine uh, observable in three dimensions. Um, and so you got three orthogonal projectors. And then you consider another observable that share one projector, but the other two are different. And the original notion that goes back to the 60s was that the, um, the uh, if you want the either variable model or ontological model was giving the same value assignment to this one projector, independently of the fact that I measure it in the context of observable A or observable B, which share one projector by assumption. So um, this can be basically translated in an operational equivalence. So you've got this one projector, which is really the same independently of the fact that you're measuring it as part of observable A or as part of observable B. So there is an operational equivalence there. So these two you cannot distinguish if I measure in that one projector as part of A or B. So uh, you should represent um, that uh, that projector in the same way in your in your classical emulator. So which is this um, where where I where do I have it? Yes. So well, this notion here. This is much generalized because now you're saying that this, well, if it is true for these projectors, why shouldn't it be true for more general objects? So this was the idea um, of this paper by uh, Speckens since 2005. Um, so, yes, yeah, sorry, I don't, I'm not sure. I, I think it, 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 even when I started to look at these things, it was immediately obvious to me the connection. So I can, uh, I imagine it can be a bit confusing. It was quite confusing to me at the start. But essentially, the, this notion is a generalization, and um, and uh, and there uh, you you mentioned non-commutativity. In this case, these observables must be non-commuting. No, these observable A and B, um, and 
And that would give yeah. rise to a contextual scenario if they were non-commuting. Sorry? That would give rise to a con- contextual scenario. Then. Yeah, 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 exactly. So, uh, well, uh, or yeah, a, a scenario where uh, it becomes difficult to make a single assignment to this one projector uh, uh, if it's, yeah, uh, the, independently of the fact that it's part of the context A, so observable A, or the context B, also observable would be. Um, but uh, so here, uh, Yes, so, and the, the basic justification here is to say, okay, that notion is actually a particular case of this notion. And in fact, one can show it formally that it is. Um, but I think it, it, has, it has a meaning by its own, this uh, notion by, to some extent to me, it's clear even conceptually what it means, uh, this uh, Speckens notion here, because you're saying you have things that cannot be distinguished operationally, why should they be distinguished or distinct or given distinct descriptions in your uh, underlying model? So that's the idea um, behind it. Okay, thanks very much. Um, yeah, so um, let's move on to some of the questions from the audience. So Mauro um, has well has quite a, bunch, a few comments and questions, so let me just read them all out um, kind of verbatim. Mm-hmm. So, so Mauro says, uh, if I may, and I'm probably anticipating points that Matteo will tackle soon, um, this was based, by the way, asked sort of midway during the talk. So uh, he says, one, contextuality or lack thereof to certify non-classicality is fascinating, but also very demanding. Is it the case that we have to go all the way to such demanding and deep layer of requests to prove the non-classical character of a process? Um, well, um, in a sense, it's not very demanding in a sense that, in a sense, it's very general. I mean, there may be models that you're not ready to call classical, even though they're non-contextual. So this is a very, so what I was trying to say here, um, maybe a bit before, I was taking examples from the literature. I mean, the whole of classical mechanics is an example of a non-contextual model. So if you have a certificate that is able to exclude all possible classical mechanics models, that's already uh, quite a general thing. And there are, of course, many other models that can be seen as non-contextual, like, for example, these discrete Markov models, as I was mentioning. So in a sense, it's a very big basket, no? Um, where, um, if you wish, like, if you're, even if you're just interested, say, in, uh, say, models where you use Amil- classical Hamiltonian dynamics, if you find a certificate of this kind, then you know certainly that there cannot be any just classical Hamiltonian dynamics model for whatever fancy Hamiltonian you choose, because this, every such model is an example of a non-contextual ontological model. So in a sense, you've got a very big set, and here you've got all of uh, classical mechanics here. Um, and then you've got many other things that you're excluding in principle. Um, so in a sense, um, I don't know, maybe I didn't understand the sense in which you, uh, you you thought it was demanding. I mean, I think it is demanding in other ways. I was trying to uh, point this out towards the end. Um, but in terms of just the definition of the class of models, this is a very large set of models, and it includes all of classical mechanics. So that's, um, if you can exclude all of these things, you're excluding in particular uh, any classical mechanics model. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess maybe it might be hard to actually experimentally certify non-classicality, uh, non-contextuality. Sorry, right? I mean, if if this, if you really have to check every possible preparation and measurement outcome, yes, maybe, so, maybe it's demanding mm, in that sense. Ah, yes. Okay. Experimentally, I think it is quite demanding. So I think you would need to check it on a essentially on a tomographically complete set, uh, which I think for a single qubit you could you can do. So I think one could devise an experiment for the single qubit to stroke engine. Um, um, then, of course, one can wonder to what extent it is useful uh, to, do, to do such certification, or maybe we should maybe wait for better certificates and then try to, to, um, to uh, do an experiment on those. Uh, but yeah, they are quite, um, it is quite demanding, yes. Uh, but the ex- exclusion that you're trying also to realize is also quite uh, demanding. So I guess they go hand in hand. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Uh, okay, so I'll move to Mara's second point. Uh, he says, in continuous variable systems, a good Trojan horse could be the use of Gaussian frameworks. 
Yes. Mm -hmm. So Ga Gaussian, actually, this is quite interesting question because uh, there is a non-contextual model that reproduces the whole set of Gaussian quantum mechanics. So this is a paper by, uh, where I remember there is Terry Rudolph, Rob Speckens, and Steve, Stephen Bartlett in there. Um, so they provide an explicit non-contextual model that reproduces all statistics that you can get by using only Gaussian states, Gaussian transformations, and Gaussian measurements. So uh, in particular, uh, yeah, so there is a classical emulation in this sense of everything that you can do with Gaussian-only resources. If you input some non-Gaussian resources, then uh, yes, then it becomes something that you cannot uh, obtain within this set of models. And the model is just essentially classical mechanics with some uh, um, some limitation on your phase space resolution. So this is what the, the model is. Um, yeah, so you wouldn't call, yeah. So here you would, any engine which is just like that, you can reproduce it with such classical model with phase space distributions. And then uh, you wouldn't call it, um, yeah, you wouldn't be able to certify anything using this basically. Or better, you would say, okay, I know how to emulate that by a classical Hamiltonian model. Okay, thanks. And then uh, Maro has one final point. Uh, so um, the proof is valid for unitaries. Do I need the time reversal of a general map in the open case and then superimpose it to the time forward map? Um, it's a good question. Um, yes, I don't know. I should think about what happens in, in the case where you don't have a unitary, yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry, I haven't thought about it. Uh, that's the honest answer. <laughs> I see. So this would apply st strictly to kind of um, stroke engines, right? So ones where you have you separate the coupling to the bath from the the unitary stage. Yeah, I think basically what you need in general is is uh, something which looks like this condition, even if it's not uh, unitary. Uh, you uh, what you need is uh, this condition here. So you need that this is now assume that this is a channel, uh, so it's not anymore a unitary. You need to be able to mix it to something, which I don't think it's necessarily the inverse of that, but you need to be able to mix it with then some second channel in a way that you get, uh, you can decompose that mixture in terms of just the identity and some other channel where the, I, the weight of the identity is almost one. It's, it's basically one up to a corrections of order G square here. So this is the basic, uh, so this operation equivalence is what makes the, um, the, uh, um, the response of any non-contextual emulator too weak to be able to reproduce uh, the quantum one. Cool, great, thanks very much. Um, no, thank you. So we have another question from, from Barish. So um, he asks one question that may be related to Mauro's question. If I remember correctly, to have a system that behaves in a contextual manner, we need to go to Hilbert space dimension three or more. So does this mean that any thermodynamic process we think of using a single qubit can be emulated by a classical system and is not truly quantum in this sense? Yes, thank you for this question. So uh, this is true for the, this original uh, notion of Kosher and Speckers, where you restrict your notion of contextuality only to projective measurements. But uh, so in that case, you will need to go to at least Qtrit. Uh, but this generalized notion of contextuality that applies also to preparations and transformations. So here it's applied to a transformation, for example. Uh, you can find proof of contextuality also for qubits. Uh, which is in fact, um, yeah, this is what uh, it's behind this proof here. So rho here is a single qubit. So um, so yes, with using this uh, more general notion of contextuality, we can in fact certify also qubit systems. Cool. Thanks very much. Um, no problem. Yeah. So. Um, Unless there are any more questions, I mean, we've already had some pretty detailed questions and answers there. So, um, uh, and I mean, so Maro says, thanks very much. Um, there's lots right. of people yeah. clapping and, and thanking you for an excellent presentation. Um, but since, um, and Barish says thanks as well, I think um, 
probably Thank in the you. interest of time, we can we can kind of conclude there. So I'll just bring my video back in just so I can you can see me. Um, but um, basically, um, just wanted to say thanks very much again, Matteo, for a really really Thank clear pedagogical talk. Um, and thanks to everyone for tuning in and participating as always. Um, and I'll send out an announcement soon um, with our, our next speaker on Friday. But yeah, thanks, Matteo. Thank you very much. Thank you.